this back in here. Our first speaker is Michael Telch. He is a professor of psychology at uh, the University of Texas at Austin and a director of the university's laboratory of the study of anxiety disorders. And today he'll be speaking with us about uh, PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and the ways that uh, we can develop to actually figure out who might be predisposed to this and take care of the problem. Uh, perhaps to some extent before it happens. So uh, Michael says that he'll be having some, some new data that he's presenting here. So please listen up and, and uh, keep, your, keep your ears open. And uh, uh, let's, uh, let's hear from Michael uh, Telch. Thank you. Okay, um, it's uh, a pleasure to be here. Um, I've never actually ever given a talk to science writers before. Uh, I think you must have a great job to be able to spend most of your time going around and finding out all sorts of cool new findings and what's happening in science around the, around the world. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, a really exciting project that we've been involved with now for several years, uh, looking at risk factors and finding ways to better understand risk factors for combat-related stress disorders, uh, PTSD, depression, and so forth. Um, wanted to thank uh, uh, Paul Rayburn for inviting me. The, um, I got an email about a week ago, which concerned me, though. He said that I needed to make my talk lively. And I thought, well, you know, trauma, Soldiers, war. So uh, this is a picture of me after I read the email. Um, especially uh, if I were talking about why women have sex, now that I could make lively. But I'm not sure I'm going to be able to make this lively. This might be as lively as it gets. Let me start by just giving you a, a brief um, a blueprint of what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to start by just giving just some very brief background on the problem of combat um, uh, PTSD and combat stress, uh, and then really start taking you through the major aims and the design of the project. Um, as the title implies, one of the major features of the project is we're really, uh, to our knowledge at least, the first group to ever uh, develop a methodology for actually measuring soldiers' combat stress reactions and stress exposure in vivo while they're actually in theater. By the way, I'm going to use that word, that phrase, in theater a lot. It just means uh, in the war zone. Uh, so I'm going to describe that system uh, to you in, in some detail and actually show you a demonstration of what the soldiers actually do when they're in Iraq um, actually filling out the stress log. Uh, and then I'm going to be showing you some uh, findings, some of which are just right, literally, uh, just have come out the last couple days. Uh, no one's, in fact, some of the co-investigators haven't even seen them yet. And then probably end by talking about some uh, implications of the work and future directions. As I'm talking, um, if you're needing clarification, feel free to interrupt me. I, I don't have this rule that I have to go through completely and answer questions at the end, so if you really do have a burning question, feel free to interrupt me. Let me start by just kind of, um, this is, as you'll come to find out, this is a fairly ambitious project, and while I'm the lead investigator, there's a number of people uh, with complementary areas of expertise that without them uh, definitely couldn't have made this project possible. First of all, there's a, a group of core investigators besides myself, uh, retired Colonel Brian Baldwin, who's at the uh, Institute for Advanced Technology at UT. Uh, he basically talked me into uh, writing the, the, the grant for the Army and, and doing this project. 
he promised me he could get the soldiers from Fort Hood, and he, and he kept his word on that promise. Uh, many, many um, anxiety and uh, psychological researchers would love to study soldiers. The big dilemma is getting access to them, and Brian made that happen. Um, one of our co-investigators who is uh, really focusing in on the neuroimaging and to some extent the genetics, um, he was at Pittsburgh, he's now at Duke, um, Dr. Ahmad Harari. Uh, and uh, at the end of the talk, if any of you want more specific information about certain components, I may actually direct you to some of these core uh, co-investigators who, who have expertise, let's say, in a particular area that you might be interested in. Uh, a colleague of mine at UT in the psych department, uh, Dr. Chris Beavers, uh, he is a depression researcher and also has um, really contributed, as you'll see, uh, in developing a very nice eye-tracking paradigm for looking at soldiers' uh, attentional bias, which we think may be operating as a risk factor. And then Dr. Deborah Stoat uh, at the uh, UT Imaging Center and the Psychology Department. Uh, she, along with Dr. Harari, have done a lot of, um, have been the architects, really, of the neuroimaging component uh, looking at brain functioning and brain structure. Then we have some very top-notch consultants. David Goldman at NIAAA is one of the top geneticists in the world. Uh, Neil Rutledge, a local radiologist, has helped us with some of the imaging issues. And um, Dr. Wayne Scherner at uh, uh, Carl Darnell Army Medical Center is our kind of medical liaison, so when a soldier coming back is in trouble, uh, we uh, hook up with Dr. Scherner and he gets that soldier some assistance. And we have a host of graduate students, um, uh, doctoral students, as well as undergraduates and a few postdoctoral fellows working on the project. Uh, so as you can see, it's a real team effort. Uh, we've all seen the stories on CNN or Fox News, um, all the stories about the um, some of the horrific uh, experiences that some of our soldiers wind up experiencing uh, in the context of their uh, serving our country. I um, want to talk a little bit, um, there have been dozens, literally dozens of surveys now for the soldiers returning from Iraq and Afghanistan. Most of these are just the soldiers come back uh, in large numbers, they're given a paper and pencil questionnaire, and from that data, we know that about 90% of soldiers coming back uh, had been reporting that they had been exposed to some kind of pretty significant uh, combat experience of a traumatic nature. Depending on the, the specific survey, uh, anywhere between 30 and 18% of the soldiers returning actually meet uh, for a criterion for a full-blown post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, again, this is based on a questionnaire assessment. There's some suggestion that that may inflate, uh, to some extent, the, the rates. But nevertheless, it's, it's a very significant problem. If you actually go into VAs and, and look at the soldiers who've, uh, when they've returned to enter the VA healthcare system, uh, then you get uh, anywhere from 27 to 45% have actually been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. And it, PTSD is the kind of problem that once you get it without, without treatment, it, um, it doesn't come and go. It's a fairly chronic debilitating disorder and um, naturalistic follow-ups of, of trauma victims suggest that they're uh, showing significant disability for 10 years or longer. Once you have PTSD, the consequences can be quite uh, devastating. Uh, and they, they um, fall into uh, various spheres of functioning. So they affect and uh, uh, contribute to medical problems, as you can see. They contribute to emotional difficulties and psychiatric disorders. They contribute to social dysfunction and um, even vocational functioning. So, they're the kind of disorder in which, when you have it, the consequences are really quite severe. 
Hence, it really does make sense to do whatever we can to truly, really understand what are the factors that might actually increase vulnerability for these disorders. And from that information, could we develop early intervention programs that might actually prevent uh, these soldiers from developing these debilitating disorders? We do know um, a little bit uh, now about the some risk factors, again, uh, very kind of a limited or restricted range of risk factors, all done through questionnaire surveys, um, pretty much of soldiers returning. But this study in particular, I like, it, it, it really a very uh, representative sample in 24 different uh, geographic locations. And what came out uh, were the following uh, factors. So, uh, officers tended to do a bit better in terms of not being quite so vulnerable to PTSD relative to non-officers. Uh, being in the Air Force served as kind of a protective uh, factor that if you were in the Air Force you were less likely to develop PTSD relative to the other branches of the military. Um, those uh, who were either discharged or retired had an increased risk of developing PTSD. Uh, as did females, as did being Hispanic. And something that we've known from the Vietnam War uh, and through non-military uh, trauma research is that being exposed to more intensive combat experiences surely uh, is a risk factor. And in conjunction with that, the extent to which you perceive your life to be threatened as part of those combat experiences, really does seem to ramp up uh, vulnerability to these um, combat stress disorders. Um, I think it's starting with um, after sergeant. Um, but there are tremendous gaps right now in our understanding of the uh, risk factors for combat-related stress disorders. And again, part of it is the reliance on uh, either cross-sectional methodologies um, or, again, these retrospective designs where they come back and then you assess uh, what kinds of potential risk factors they may have had. And among the few studies that really have started by taking soldiers before they go um, for deployment and studying those, they're still, uh, they're very limited by virtue of that the kinds of risk factors that they've looked at are the kinds of things I just showed you, things like demographic factors and kind of categories uh, of uh, rank and the like. And no study uh, up to now until this one has actually used a methodology of actually going into the war zone and assessing soldiers' combat uh, experiences and the reactions to those experiences um, uh, repeatedly while they're deployed in, the, in Iraq. So, our project mission. We basically are, the overarching goal is to shed new light on possible causes of PTSD and related combat stress disorders. And when I say related, I'm talking about depression, uh, because I think PTSD gets all the limelight, but uh, depression is very prevalent and very debilitating as well. Uh, other kinds of anxiety and stress disorders are also part of the clinical picture, uh, as is uh, traumatic brain injury. So uh, when I'm talking about, uh, as you'll see, as I get into some of the uh, findings, we're, we're we're going more broadly than just looking at PTSD. Um, just to give you a preview of some of the uh, features of the project, first of all, we use a prospective approach. What that means is, um, in order to get into the study, soldiers are actually, uh, they can't have any prior combat exposure. They're kind of newbies in that sense. Uh, they'll, they undergo a very elaborate assessment before they're deployed and we get to then look at these factors that we measure prior to deployment and look at their ability to predict problems subsequently. That's the notion of prospective. 
And I mentioned we use this, we've developed, uh, and it's fully operational, and I'll be giving you some data on it. You'll see it uh, demonstrated. An innovative web-based technology for, again, assessing the kinds of uh, combat experiences that are going on for these soldiers, as well as a fairly detailed assessment of the kinds of uh, psychological and physical reactions they're having uh, to those stressors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's, uh, okay, the question is, it gets at the reactivity of measurement, that is, does the mere measurement of these things somehow um, influence things? And the answer may is, it, it could, it could. We, I'm gonna sh actually show you data that shows soldiers' reactions. We did an actual consumer survey of their, um, when they returned, what they felt about filling out the form in Iraq. So I'll be presenting that data. But this whole reactivity thing, you could take it to the extreme. All science involves measurement, and so you can't actually do science without measuring things. And if the measuring things affects things, that, that same concern could be voiced about almost any empirical uh, study. But I think the real defense is that you're looking within the group, all of whom have the same reactivity, you're asking about differences in their, in their preconditions and their responses. And you're not comparing them to the people who aren't. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Oh yeah, I'll, let me get into, I have, I'll get into the actual project as soon. Uh -huh. Why don't we say, why don't we save it, because that's going to really cut into the time, I think. Why don't we uh, just kind of jot down your questions mentally, and then I, uh, we should have time to answer them. The last point, and that's, is, this is a really critical one, and that is um, one of the things you'll see that becomes really obvious is what we've done is to try to go beyond the idea. <laughs> okay, it's 9.30. Uh, rather than just look at, at soldiers filling out questionnaires, as you'll see, uh, shortly, that the um, kind of data that we're collecting is um, cuts across multiple systems of human functioning. So, for instance, we are getting DNA from the soldiers that allows us to look at their at certain kinds of uh, genetic biomarkers that we think might serve as susceptibility factors. We're looking at uh, both structural and functional brain imaging to look at brain function as well as certain a uh, size of certain brain areas that we feel might be implicated in combat stress problems. We've included, and you'll see a demonstration of um, our carbon dioxide stress challenge, which is quite potent, to look at soldiers before they get deployed, how they respond to a very significant stress challenge. Does that actually link up to how they respond in theater when they're exposed to stresses there? And then all sorts of measures of the actual experiences in the environment that the soldiers are exposed to. So this is the, the kind of guiding uh, principle was to move beyond the kind of questionnaire approach and to really um, uh, begin to look at some of the other areas of functioning that might actually be potential risk factors for susceptibility to PTSD and other combat stress problems. So let me take you through kind of the nuts and bolts of the study design. The study design, it basically has three phases or three components. The first one we call our pre-deployment assessment. 
And in essence, and I'll go through each of these stations with you in a minute, um, but basically, soldiers are brought in from Fort Hood. They come in about eight or nine at a time in a van supplied by Fort Hood. They spend a whole day with us at the Imaging Center. And during that time, they go through a series of assessment stations, each kind of focused on a different possible uh, risk domain. So genetics, neuroimaging, psychological assessment, uh, cognitive assessment, and this uh, carbon dioxide stress challenge. And the, the, the approximate times are listed, as you can see. Then, the second component is they're deployed, or at least most of them were deployed. And while they're deployed, every 30 days, they are actually sent an email to log into this online web-based system that we developed to try to get data on how they're doing, what kinds of experiences they've had in theater, and what have there been react those reactions to those experiences. Then they come back, hopefully, and when they do come back, they undergo a re-administration of the same kinds of uh, measures that we took at, at pre-deployment, with the exception of the genetics. Once we have their, their genetic information, we don't need to take that again. Um, but in addition, um, on the post-deployment assessment, we couldn't ask about their experiences pre-deployment because they hadn't had any yet. Uh, so uh, at the post-deployment assessment, when they return, here are some of the major areas. We're using the uh, uh, DRRI, which is an instrument developed by the Kings, um, to really, um, retrospectively at least, look at some of the, the stress factors um, that were operating, at least based on their recollection. We also then get to compare that to our in-theater assessment to see just whether or not they, uh, uh, they're congruent. At some point, we don't have funding to do it yet, but we're applying for funding. We would love to do a 12-month follow-up, but that is not part of the study yet. We're hoping uh, that we can get the money to actually do a follow-up. We know that sometimes PTSD doesn't develop right away after post-deployment. It takes a while. And so we're really hoping to be able to follow the cohort of soldiers that we've looked at so far. Here's where we stand as of now. We've uh, enrolled 184 soldiers. Uh, of those, 178 were actually deployed. Of those, 162 of the soldiers actually completed one or more of our in-theater assessments. In other words, the majority 91% uh, actually did complete the in-theater assessment, which was really quite a pleasant surprise to us. So far, 161 of the 178 soldiers have finished their post-deployment assessment, and we are hoping to try to get the remaining uh, 17, or as many of those last 17 in, uh, to finish up their post-deployment. as I mentioned about the um, hope to try to get funding for the follow-up. Soldiers are recruited um, all through Fort Hood. Uh, initially, I would go with um, our project manager, retired Colonel Baldwin, who knows everyone at Fort Hood, and we would go together. And the chain of command would select certain units uh, we, we asked them, we wanted mostly combat units, but we had a few combat support units. And uh, once these units were selected, we met with them in a, in a fairly large room, uh, and we, I basically did a presentation about the study. And of the people, that, of the soldiers that we made presentations to, about 85% actually volunteered to participate, which is a huge, huge, huge rate of um, volunteering for a research project. Um, the Internal Review Board made us have an ombudsman present in the recruitment sessions to make sure that there were no coercion from the officers uh, telling these soldiers that they had to participate. And so um, uh, we believe that they were really uh, participating on a voluntary basis. 
In order to be eligible, though, they actually had to be scheduled for deployment within 60 days. And no previous deployment experience, um, and obviously they had to consent to participate and had no medical problems. Uh, typically, they wouldn't be deployed anyway if they did. Um, here were the different units uh, that participated, uh, 10 units in total. As you can see, about 80% were combat units, and then uh, a couple of the units were combat support units. A little bit of information on the actual people we enrolled. So you, as you can see, the majority were males. Um, about a third of the sample uh, were from minorities. Uh, about half uh, had a little, had some education more than high school. Um, about a third were married, and almost all were enlisted as opposed to uh, being officers. So I, when I showed you that design slide, I showed you kind of the different things. I'm going to take you through now each of the five major assessment stations to give you a better feeling for what actually the soldiers did, uh, the kinds of measures we took at pre-deployment, and why. The first assessment station was the genetic assessment, and basically uh, interested in trying to shed light on are there certain genetic markers, certain variants of genes that might actually predispose uh, soldiers to develop combat stress problems. At this point, once you have the DNA, you can do all sorts of analyses, and there'll be analyses being done for a long time. But right now, most of the analyses on the genetics are focusing on various polymorphisms of the serotonin gene. Um, the one in particular that we've started to look at already is the, uh, basically the serotonin transporter gene. Uh, we'll just call it the CERT for short. And it seems to be implicated in anxiety, it's implicated in depression. You can either have uh, two long alleles of that gene, you can have one short, one long, two short, and no long. What appears to be the case is that the presence of one or two short alleles has been shown in previous studies to be implicated in certain kinds of emotional uh, disorders. And so we went in thinking, well, let's look at that. Uh, oh, and by the way, the, um, it's just as simple. The test is just literally um, uh, having the soldiers just deposit a sample of saliva into the special retainer cup. The, once the white top is screwed on, it mixes a fluid in, which allows the uh, DNA to be uh, extracted and stored for long periods of time before they're sent off to uh, uh, the lab with uh, Dr. Goldman. Okay, station two, neuroimaging. Um, these are pictures all from our new imaging research center at the University of Texas. And um, you're going to see this a lot where that's a real soldier and the army requires us to block their face out. So if you see a soldier that doesn't have their face blocked out, close your eyes. Um, but in essence, uh, to the lower right, uh, the woman, Dr. Stote, as I said, she's one of the architects of the neuroimaging component. Basically, if you, th uh, if you think about it, we're, we're looking at two primary uh, things here. One is brain structure. Are there certain areas of the brain that are too small, too big? and then brain function. So we're doing both MRI and fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging. Right now, we're focusing on three different brain regions that previous work has shown might be implicated in PTSD. The first is the amygdala, and that's kind of the uh, very implicated in fear conditioning, uh, memory modulation. Uh, our co-investigator, Dr. Ahmad Harari has developed an actual uh, procedure, an imaging procedure that has been shown to reliably activate that area of the brain, the amygdala, so that we can look at that, how each soldier's amygdala functions in response to threatening emotional material. 
So the way his paradigm works is once they're in the scanner, the, a little screen comes down, and they're showed either neutral objects like the bottom right with just the dots, or they're shown all of a sudden flash pictures of faces with an emotional uh, tone to them. And the difference in how the amygdala lights up between when, how the brain reacts when these neutral uh, tones, neutral uh, objects are shown versus the emotional faces, that serves as a reliable index of the activation of the amygdala. One of the things that I should say about that is there's really quite a few studies showing if you take PTSD patients and image them, they definitely have hyperactive, hyperactivity in that part of the brain. The real question that hasn't been addressed though is, is that just a function of having PTSD or do these people have a pre-existing hyperreactivity in that part of the brain that predisposes them to develop PTSD? So just because you see hyperactivity with PTSD patients doesn't mean it actually pre-existed and caused the problem. It just might be a concomitant or a consequence. The next part of the next brain region of interest is the prefrontal cortex. It's kind of the area of the brain responsible for executive functioning, how we make decisions. Uh, it's kind of plays a big role in our conscious, conscience and also kind of plays a very important role in inhibiting certain behavior so we don't say things that are inappropriate or do things that are inappropriate. And unlike the amygdala, this area of the brain in PTSD patients is underactivated, meaning that they show hypo-reactivity. So there's an underestimation. But the same logic applies to the amygdala. That is, we don't know, because there haven't been the kind of prospective studies yet, to know whether that reduced activation is just part of having PTSD, or whether these, soul, these people have this reduced activation to start with, and that contributes to their development of these problems. And then the final brain region of interest is the hippocampus. The hippocampus is uh, very involved in uh, memory. And there have been, oh, literally a dozen studies or more looking at the size of the hippocampus in PTSD with fair consistency showing that most studies show that patients with PTSD show reduced hippocampal volume, their, hippocamp their hippocampi because there's actually a, kind of a right and a left, they're actually reduced relative to non-PTSD. There's various theories about why that might be, whether the stress increases cortisol production, which then deteriorates the hippocampus. Um, but again, we, all we know really right now is that um, PTSD patients have smaller hippocamp hippocampi. Okay, that's station number two. Station number three is the clinical assessment. It really consists of two major parts. Um, one of the things we're really proud of is that, that um, both prior to deployment and then when soldiers get back, we d do full structured diagnostic interviews by a trained clinician. So rather than just diagnosing a mental disorders through a questionnaire, which has been shown to be only marginally reliable, we're using the gold standard methodology for assessing uh, mental disorders, both prior to the soldiers leaving as well as when they return. Um, in addition, um, they complete, and this is a, these are the actual uh, group of soldiers, they go online and complete about a dozen or so um, selected questionnaires assessing everything from uh, substance abuse and, and um, uh, trait anger, anxiety sensitivity, all sorts of things that we believe and the literature supports that may operate as possible risk factors. The beauty of this, it's all paperless. Um, we've developed a system where all of these questionnaires are taken online. They're immediately, uh, the information is immediately encoded and stored at the uh, ITSUT, and it really cuts down the amount of time needed to uh, be able to look at the data. So for this uh, clinical assessment, I just, just to help you, I gave kind of what some of the suspected risk variables are on the left and the way that we're measuring them on the right. And just, this is just in this third station or third domain of 
um, uh, of work. The fourth station, um, we, we call it our eye tracking station. Uh, Dr. Chris Beavers, as I mentioned, was the architect of this. Um, there's been a, 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 quite a bit of work in particularly anxiety and depression showing that people who have both anxiety disorders and mood disorders show biased uh, processing or biased attention for emotional material. There tends to be a kind of a greater hypervigilance for emotional material. We don't know, though, if that's a kind of byproduct of having an emotional disorder or whether or not these individuals have just this pre-existing condition where they're, they're kind of more vigilant or more attentive to emotional material. By far, the um, most state-of-the-art way of assessing attention to emotional material is this new eye-tracking uh, methodology. Um, basically, the way it works, uh, the soldier puts his chin kind of like you're going to an optometrist. Um, the eyes are focused on a computer screen in front of him. And he's shown um, a series of faces for 30 seconds. Uh, and again, that's exactly what the soldier would see. Um, the order of either uh, sad face, neutral face, happy face, or threatened face. And the order um, every 30 seconds gets changed and the faces change, new people come on. But in essence, what the test does is it looks at where is the subject looking and how long do they look, with the ultimate um, bottom line measure being the percent of time looking at sad faces, the percent of time looking at happy, uh, percent time looking at um, and so forth, and gives us a really nice index, and it's at the level of uh, the soldier has no idea of what's going on. He's just, looking at, he's just looking at the screen. But the computer is actually tracking the actual eye gaze of the soldier as they look at these emotional uh, stimuli. Just information. What, is the, what, what are they told they're supposed to be doing? It's a good question. All they're told, because obviously, if you tell them too much, it might bias them. So all they're told is to look at the screen. They can look any place they want on the screen and um, for 30 seconds, and then a new series of faces will come on, and they, they do the exact same thing. Look any place you want. Uh, there's, there's no restrictions whatsoever. And then the final station is our carbon dioxide stress challenge test. I've been uh, using um, this particular methodology for, the study, for studying uh, risk for anxiety disorders uh, for a while now. Um, the way it works, basically, is it's very quick. Um, the soldier, in this study, we actually measured their heart rate, so we fitted them with a heart rate device. Prior to them doing the stress challenge, we actually had them administer a saliva sample for measuring their cortisol level. Cortisol is the stress hormone. You would expect that during periods of intense stress, cortisol shoots up, and then they actually inhale they take in one full vital capacity breath and hold it for five seconds. That's all it is, just one breath, vital capacity, holding it in for five seconds. It induces a very, very significant feelings of breathlessness, lightheadedness. Um, you'll actually see a demonstration a little bit later. I'll actually show you uh, two people undergoing the challenge. Um, and then we actually measure their uh, subjective, how afraid and stressed out were they in response to the challenge. 30 minutes after it's over, we take another saliva sample, which allows us to look at their cortisol response, their, st their hormone response to the stress challenge. Okay, so that's component one. Now let's turn our attention to the stress diary, the, uh, this online system that we developed to try to get a much better look at the kinds of experiences the soldiers are having while they're in theater and their reactions to them. The, um, 
one of the things that prompted me to want to really focus on trying to make this an important part of the project was what we know about the limitations of trying to assess stress well after the fact when it happens. There are three kind of primary problems with any time you're trying to retrospectively uh, assess uh, people's uh, stress reactions or experiences. One is just poor recall. They just don't re sometimes they just don't remember certain things. Sometimes there are processes, what we'll call unintentional memory biases. For instance, once you've had a strong or severe mental disorder, it taints uh, your judgment about what happened. It's not intentional. You just have this biased recall that's very much unintentional. But then you've got a third group where you can have intentional biasing, uh, compensation seeking, or wanting to get uh, attention, or wanting to minimize, intentionally minimizing the experiences. All of those things would fall into the uh, category of uh, where soldiers are intentionally biasing the information that, that uh, they give. So what's the solution? is to kind of, again, try to think of a methodology for uh, not doing it after the fact, but trying to get this information before all of these problems, these poor recall and unintentional and intentional biases kick in. Um, the advantage of doing that, obviously, is that you can do some things if you have a system in place for measuring stress in theater. Um, you can actually start to look uh, prospectively at, okay, so this thing happened, and then looking down the road, w even the next month, what kinds of symptoms or reactions are the soldiers having in response to a particular event. Obviously, it reduces the error and reporting bias, as I mentioned earlier. And the fact that we're in we're collecting multiple assessments. Every 30 days, soldiers are logging, asked to log in and give us a new uh, sample of what's been going on with them and their reactions to them. Really allows us to look at the development of these problems over time and the sequencing of, of how they develop. And although we're not using it in this way yet, one could actually see that one real possibility would be with a system in place like this, one could actually begin to identify soldiers in theater who are starting to have problems based on the kinds of things they're reporting back in their stress logs and um, potentially have some kind of early intervention. So let me show you the combat experience log. It basically has two pieces to it. Um, there were some developmental challenges along the way. Uh, the amount of programming, um, Basically, uh, a very, very talented doctoral student of mine who's now a professor at University of Wisconsin worked with me. I kind of basically told him what I would like this to do, and he found a way to make it happen in terms of all the computer programming and uh, the software and the like. But there are some developmental challenges in terms of what are you going to include. You can't include too much, because if you do, you wind up, uh, soldiers will not want to fill it out. But you, on the other hand, you don't want to be too skimpy either. How do you monitor who's using it and who's not? That had to be, uh, those uh, challenges had to be uh, brainstormed and solutions to them. And then how do you get soldiers to comply? Are there any things you could do? And we wound up using a reminder system. Um, we have a tracking system where the staff would look and if soldiers didn't complete their 30-day uh, log, they got a, another email um, uh, reminder. When you think about it, the data management, all these data coming in, uh, it's, a, it's a data management nightmare. And yet, um, again, uh, Hanju Lee, my, uh, my doctoral student, really found a, a wonderful way to um, manage the data uh, in an automatic fashion. And then data analysis. Um, major challenges there. So the requirement is that the soldiers do have to have access to the internet. They log in to an online system. Um, as I said, they, they're sent email reminders to log in. Um, and then, as soon as they fill it out, 
immediately, within a second after they press the submit button, the data is already here at UT, already uh, coded and ready to look at. It has two components. Part one is war zone stressors, uh, the kinds of experiences that they've had. And part two is what kinds of reactions they've had to those stressors. Part one, um, you know, uh, 18 different combat zone experiences are listed. Um, here's a few examples of them. And it also allows some flexibility they can write in their own. Part two is the kinds of stress reactions. And we're looking at both PTSD symptoms, depressor, depressive symptoms, uh, symptoms of traumatic brain injury, and symptoms of just general anxiety and, and uh, stress problems. So here's an example of the email reminder they get. And let's see if this works. This is what a soldier would do. Exactly what you're seeing is what a soldier will do. But he's on stimulants because, as you'll see, it, I have him going through it very, very fast. <laughs> Normally, soldiers wouldn't go through it quite this fast. But here's part one, the kinds of stresses they've experienced. So you just check the ones that you experienced in the last 30 days. And then you're asked to, to list the one that was the most stressful to you. And that person said being wounded. Um, then section two, uh, all sorts of different reactions. Don't worry, it speeds up. program was smart enough to know that that soldier listed that as the most stressful event, so now he rates uh, certain things about that event. And this is a um, measure of depression here. Uh, about five minutes. It's 10 o'clock. Okay. Anyway, um, back at UT, I've blot I blotted out the actual names and IDs of the soldiers. But basically, there's an accounting system. Numbers in blue tell us that they filled it out, numbers in red. And so it's a really sophisticated accounting system that allows us to send emails to those soldiers who actually haven't completed the log. Um, in the, in the, just for time purposes, I want to kind of um, tell you that Here's the usage, 9% of the soldiers didn't complete it, 53% completed 1 to 5 entries, 13% 6 to 10, and 25% uh, uh, completed 11 or more entries. So that was basically the utilization data on how they used it. And um, ease of use, we did the survey when they returned, uh, 121 soldiers took it. And basically, the majority said that it was easy to complete, um, easy to understand. Uh, the email reminders were annoying to about a third of the people. Um, some said it was time consuming, but not very many. And very few people said it was a waste of time. One of the things we were interested in was, would it be upsetting to talk about your reactions? And very few soldiers, as you can see, only 4%, said it was upsetting. In fact, 20% said it made him feel better, and 60% said it didn't make him feel either worse or better. Most common reason for not completing it was not access to the internet. Okay, come on. I just 
seems to be kind of stuck here. Okay, what are the top five war zone stressors? Based on the data from Iraq that the soldiers were giving us, this is, this is what came out. The average soldier for an average month listed about almost six stress items per month. What did the soldiers' mental status look like before deployment and then when they came back? So we broke it into, this is actually before they left only. And it's the percent who is showing current, uh, one or more current mental illnesses or, or a history of mental illness. As you can see, about 50% had some kind of mental disorder in the past and about a little over 18% had a current mental disorder. And this is before being deployed. How about when they returned? Again, as you can see, uh, since their deployment, about 40% of the soldiers actually developed one or more mental disorders sometime uh, since their deployment. And about 21% uh, actually had a mental disorder at the time of the evaluation. I'm going to um, actually um, um, go through this very fast because I wanted to show you the new data and I have a feeling that um, time is running out. Um, this just shows that the serotonin transporter gene does seem to be predicting um, soldiers' response to the eye tracking. That is, those showing one or two short alleles of the serotonin transporter gene show a kind of movement away from fat stimuli and over time focusing more on happy, almost showing an attentional avoidance of emotional material. Um, same thing at pre-deployment, those showing vulnerability, genetic vulnerability, seem to be much more reactive to the CO2 challenge. So, do, but the most important Thing is many of our risk factors collected um, actually predict people's combat stress problems while they're in Iraq. That's the key question that we're trying to address. And we use what's called a diathesis by uh, stress model. Um, it basically looks at the potential risk factor and how it interacts with the level of stress exposure. So let me try to take you through just one of these. Um, this is looking at a prior on a history of a mental illness as a risk factor. And the best way to, to think about this is the red line are the soldiers that actually have some history of a mental illness before they're deployed. Notice that when the stress is low in theater, there's really not much difference. But as the stress gets greater and greater in theater, their stress symptoms go way up relative to the folks who didn't have a mental disorder at pre-deployment. No, no history. So suggesting that this is a, a, a really strong indicator of vulnerability. And it's not just for general stress, also for depression. So look at this. For those soldiers who have no history of a mental illness prior to deployment, um, they're showing no increased risk of depression, even when the stress gets really bad. But look at, again, the people who have a history of a mental disorder, even though they don't have one uh, when they got deployed, but just that history puts them at greater risk. And the same thing with PTSD. Uh, same exact pattern of findings. Um, what about the eye tracking? Um, similar kind of thing, both for depression as well as uh, anxiety that again, uh, those who are showing this kind of a high bias, um, they're really biased attentions for emotional materials, that seems to be a risk factor 
for greater combat stress problems in theater. What about the CO2? Here's a demonstration. This, this is not a soldier. These are people, just to show you what this is like. His panic attack starts right about now. Now someone else, as you can see, those quite different reactions. Okay, well, what, is the, what, is, what does our data show on the CO2 test? Remember, it, it only takes literally a minute to do it. And yet, what we're finding is a, a nice effect in that those who are CO2 reactive at pre-deployment actually are showing much more problems in theater than the people who are showing low CO2 reactivity. And this is with uh, uh, general stress symptoms and we're getting the same thing for PTSD as well. That, again, a much, uh, this is PTS, level of PTSD symptoms in theater. And again, this whopping difference here is showing that those who are CO2 reactive, it seems to be a potential useful risk indicator that could be used. And these are all new. This, this hasn't been shown before. Uh, lastly, um, I've been involved in work on a construct called anxiety sensitivity. It's actually measured with a questionnaire. The best way of thinking about it, it's, it's not anxiety per se, it's the fear of anxiety. And people who are showing high anxiety sensitivity at pre-deployment also seem to be vulnerable to PTSD symptoms in theater, as well as, believe it or not, depression. And this is new. No one has talked about, I mean, it's anxiety sensitivity. It also looks like it might be a depression sensitivity as well because, my goodness, look at those who are low on anxiety sensitivity. They're not showing any, any response to, to stressors in terms of their depression, but the people high on anxiety sensitivity, they're getting much more depressed in response to the experiences in Iraq. So anyway, I think that we've demonstrated, um, wrap up here, um, that this multi-system approach where we go beyond just questionnaires and look at genes and look at imaging and brain functioning and so forth um, has some value. And having a system that allows us to track stress reactions and stress uh, experiences in theater really gives us an opportunity to uncover things that we could just not do before. And um, I think lastly, some of the implications is as we get better and better at identifying some of these, we may be able to actually inoculate soldiers before they go, before they're deployed, to try to reduce their risk. Some of these risk factors really are modifiable, just like cholesterol is modifiable for heart disease. We could use the online stress log to actually identify soldiers when they first start to show early signs of combat and maybe um, have interventions in theater in place for when these early signs are actually appearing. Anyway, we're hoping to keep getting funding and run more soldiers, and thanks for letting me go over. Not working? There we go. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, we probably have time for two questions at the most, and then we'll take a break. And then, Michael, if, if you could stick around, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions on, on what you've just discussed. So uh, let's, 
get started. Uh, if I could squeeze two very quick questions in my quick question. Uh, one is, it seems it's, uh, in the PTSD field, it seems a big problem is there's stigma associated with the disorder and soldiers therefore don't report symptoms to superiors, et cetera, or get treatment sometimes. So uh, I guess a variation on her question of what the soldiers, <coughs> sorry, I have a cold, are told. Um, how do you account for your high response rate and the high cooperativity in the study if this is a stigmatized disorder? Well, part of it is the anonymity. So uh, they go through a very significant orientation session and a consent form that literally spells out. So they don't really, um, they're told that they could be doing lines of cocaine all the way to UT and that that would be fine because um, the, the data is completely confidential with the exception of whether they're uh, thinking of harming themselves or harming another person. So I think that anonymity really does reduce the stigma because they don't perceive that their officers or their uh, fellow soldiers are actually um, privy to what's going on with them. Uh, and my other question is that you know, this summer at, or spring, I guess, um, a meta-analysis has come out that calls the short, long serotonin. I know. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious what, what you think of the, uh, what, uh, what your current thinking is on whether that's a, a valid measure. Um, I think it's... What did the meta-analysis find? There's a, what he's referring to is that, uh, that particular genetic marker that I was looking at, and we are looking at. Um, a, a, a new study just came out combining results of a number of different studies showing that probably uh, earlier reports uh, when, you, when you look at all the data, it, it showed that it wasn't really doing as much as we thought. And my guess is that I think that's what we're going to find as well. If I were to uh, guess, what we're going to find is that it's not going to be predicting uh, like we thought it was. Thanks. I noticed that. I know the, these are preliminary data, but in your, um, the second, the top five stressor, the second one was bad news from home. Yeah. Is that, um, was that a surprise, and how does that fit in with this big? It, it was a real surprise to me, and um, in, in retrospect, it's, it's not anymore, but I think uh, soldiers in today's wars are really, um, in some ways, it's, it's a kind of a, a approach avoidance thing. On one hand, they're flooded because of the internet. Uh, not only do they have the stressors uh, in the war zone, but they're constantly bombarded with what's happening at home. Um, I just heard the other day about a soldier who actually, whose wife uh, emailed him and said she was so depressed that she was thinking of killing herself. Um, she wound up killing herself. And then uh, in theater, he killed himself. Um, and so um, the internet is great as well because it does allow you to get the support and the love but you wouldn't believe the stories I heard. Um, I did exit interviews with all the soldiers of um, you know, women moving in boyfriends and the boyfriends driving the soldiers' cars and using credit cards and all sorts of horrific things. Uh, so I think it really is a problem. And um, um, I, I don't know what the solution to it is, though. It's, it's what the internet gives us.